Well, good morning and happy Friday to you all. Uh, hopefully you're faring well through the last day of the week. And to start out the day, we're just going to go over the homework questions from Wednesday. And when I'm looking at problem A1, I quickly see that this says f of 2 equals 0. Well, that means 2 would be an x-intercept, and when I process that x-intercept into a factor, if it was a positive 2, it would have to be an x minus 2. Therefore, a1 is false. As I look at a2, a2 is coming across here. It says f of 2 equals 0, which would process into an x minus 2 being a factor, as long as when I plug my 2 in and take 3 times 2 cubed minus 2, excuse me, not 2, it's 9, and I take minus 9 times 2 minus 6, if that equals 0, then it is true, and this one is true. As we move into the next one, we are looking at B1. B1 looks like it has a graph, or has an x-intercept at negative 1, and it has a double at 2, therefore it would kiss at 2. So I got a negative 1, I got a double here at 2. End behavior, right hand should be going up because A is positive, left should be going down. That one is true. As I look at B2, I see this has an x-intercept at positive 1 and a double at negative 2, which is just the opposite here, therefore B2 is false. As I move right along here, this is kind of a confusing one. f of x is a cubic function. If f1 equals 0, f3 equals 0, and f5 equals 8, what that really means is I have a function f of x. I could write it as x minus 1 times x minus 3 times x minus 5, but there is one key point about this function that I do not know, and they didn't tell me anything about my a value. So because I don't know my a value, it's really going to be difficult to see what f of 5 is. f of 5 could equal 8 if a is 1, but what if a is something other than 1? So I'm going to say this is false because it does not have to be f of 5. When I look down here at c, talking about the exact same cubic function, and here it's saying f of 5 could be anything, which is true because it could be any number based off of what a is put in. So I'm going to say c2 is true. On to d1. Well, this is looking like uh, f of x equal x minus 2 quantity squared times x minus 7. g of x is that. f of x is a reflection of g of x in the y-axis. That is false. If you actually take your graphing calculator and you graph both of them, you will see it will reflect across the x-axis, not the y-axis. And when I look at D2, D2 is talking and saying that f of x is a reflection of g of x in the y-axis. This is true, and you will see this if you graph them both. And a y-axis reflection adds a negative to each entire factor all the way through the problem. Therefore, that one is true. You wouldn't see that unless you graph that as much. I'm going to come on to the very last two. E1, I don't like how E1 is worded because how it's worded on your sheet, it says g of x is a, is a horizontal translation of f of x, period, and then they reworded all that horizontal translation parallel to the x-axis just to put it in terms of what you had. That one is true. As I spoke in Wednesday, on Wednesday in my classes, when you add or subtract inside, inside the function that translates your function horizontally opposite the sign. When I look at E2 down here, E2 is false. E2 is false because when I add or subtract something outside of the function, where you can see that plus 2 is on the outside of g of x, 
what it does is that is a vertical translation which would not put it parallel to the x-axis, it would put it parallel to the y-axis. And I still, again, don't like how this was reworded for this one. However, that is all the true-false from Wednesday. And after we finish the true-false, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to page 272 in your workbooks. And we'll give you few seconds here to get that out and um, we'll go from there. Hopefully you have it out now and all we're going to do is we're going to use this coordinate plane here on the right side and we're going to use all these characteristics of a graph to see does a graph exist given these conditions. So as I come through, if I'm looking at a degree 4, that means a few things to me. It means end behavior. End behaviors are the same direction. They either both go up or they both go down on the right-hand side. Now, if it starts in quadrant 3 and it starts ends in quadrant 4, well, that tells me both end behaviors, this side down here is going to be going down if it starts, and this side's going to be going down if it starts. As you read a book from left to right, it starts in three, ends in four. This says I have a relative maximum at x equals negative four. Well, that could be a relative maximum anywhere when x equals negative four. I'm just going to choose to put it right up about here. It could be higher, it could be lower, it doesn't matter. However, it's a relative maximum, so it will not be the highest point on the graph. And when I look at the last criteria, it has an absolute maximum at x equals 3. I just come where x is 3, and I will just make sure I'm going to go higher than my other dot was. And that needs to absolutely be the highest point in the graph. Now, can I make a graph out of this utilizing my end behaviors? Well, I can, because I can come up, and I can hit that, I can come down, I can come back up in any way, shape, or form, and it's going to turn, and it will go down, and I will put my arrows on my graph. That is a possible sketch for number 1A. Uh, remember, degree 4 could have as many as 3 turns. And I do have three turns in this one, and I have three turns because I had a couple relative extreme values in here. Oh, I can't go back there. I need to drag down to part B here now. Characteristics. Well, what this means is I have a graph that is always increasing. If it's always increasing, it can never be an even-powered function because even-powered functions and behaviors are always going the same way, which means it's going to have a turn in there somehow, some way. So it can't be even. It must be odd. It must be an odd-powered function. And I'm just going to get rid of that little bugger. And I'm going to have a y-intercept at 5, so I'm just going to come to my graph. I'm going to put a point at 5. And I'm going to have an x-intercept at negative 1.7, so I'm going to come here and I'm going to say that this is about 1.7. And is there a way to draw this graph that is going to always be increasing? Answer is yes, it is. First one I think of is I think of, if I can make a line, I'm going to make a line going through them both. That line is always increasing because it always has a positive slope. I don't have to use a line. I could have called a curve. I could have called it a cubic. And I could have brought it up like so. And it could have gone through and always increased. As long as it would be an odd-powered function going through those two points, uh, it, it's going to work for me. So I am going to now turn the page. And we are going to come on to C. And characteristics of C are the following. It is an odd degree. This means opposite end behaviors 
Also, if it's, it's going to increase to negative 3, then decrease to three, x equals 3, and then increase again, that's possible. But this particular one is stated to have an absolute maximum. Well, if I have an odd degree function, and I have any graph, my odd degrees are going to go opposites in any way, shape, or form, or they could go like this, doesn't really matter. There is absolutely no way, no pun intended, to give an absolute high point, seeing how I'm always increasing, always decreasing. It will never be the absolute maximum on there. So odd functions or odd degree functions can not have absolute extrema. Now extrema is just talking about a maximum or a minimum, but odd degrees cannot have that because their opposite behaviors are going opposite directions, therefore there's never an absolutely highest or absolutely lowest point on the graph. Now when I look at D, my key characteristics of D, as x approaches infinity, f of x approaches infinity, this tells me my right hand side of the graph will be going up. Also as x approaches negative infinity, f of x goes to infinity, and behaviors are the same. This has to be an even function. And if I have four x-intercepts, is it possible for me to have four x-intercepts? Yes, because I can make it a fourth degree function and I can make it even. Do I have a relative maximum at y equals three? This means relatively in that general vicinity, I will, maxim I will maximize out somewhere and I will touch that line. That will be the highest point somewhere, somehow. Can I make a graph of this? Yes, I can. I can grab that end behavior. I can come down. There's one x-intercept. There's two. I can kiss that, and I can come back up and make this end behavior go up. And if you notice right here, this is a relative max. These are relative minimums. One can go lower than the other, but I was able to use all the characteristics of this graph to make a graph on it. Now we're going to come up to the last one with characteristics. Instantly I'm seeing there's three characteristics. The first one tells me I have three x-intercepts. My eyes quickly shoot down to a degree two. I cannot do this because a degree two Degree two can only have a maximum of two x-intercepts. And up here with the three, that would mean it's a third degree minimum to hit it, so I cannot do this one either. Now we are on to page 274. Okay, here on page 274 what we have is we have two graphs and we're going to analyze each graph. Analyze, meaning look at it nice and closely. Tell me what type of function this could be. And what we're going to do is we're going to circle a function or functions, plural, which could model the graph and we will describe our reasoning to either eliminate or choose the function. As I'm looking at my graph right over here, as I'm looking at my graph, I quickly see my end behaviors are both going down. Well, if my end behaviors are both going down, that would mean this has to be an even, even degree function. And I can quickly rule out this one because this is an odd degree. So I will eliminate that one, because that's an odd degree. When I look at f2 of x, I am looking, I'm seeing here is x times x gives me x squared times another x gives me x to the third. 
times an x squared, because this one over here is squared, is going to give me an f to the fifth, times that x is going to give me an x to the sixth. This is an even degree, for sure. Also, I see a is negative, so I know my right-hand behavior, or as x approaches infinity, I know my f of x will be approaching negative infinity, and because it's even, the left side's going to go down, so this is all good. Both of those are matching. Furthermore, as I look at my x-intercepts, I got one here, one here, one here. I have three negative x-intercepts. Here's a negative 2, negative 1.5. Here's a negative 0.5. I do have three negative x-intercepts. I also have two positives ones right here. I got this guy and I got this guy. One of these positives is a double root, so I do have a double root at 2.5. Furthermore, past my double root, I have another one at positive 3. So I'm going to give this guy a big old circle because that one sure seems to model this behavior function over here. And now as I look at F3, F3, F3 I'm going to rule out really quick because I see that's a fourth degree. Fourth degree is an even powered function. However, a fourth degree can only, nope, forgot my N, only have at most three turns. This has one, two, three, four, five turns in it. This has five turns, so it could not be that fourth degree. It needs to be higher than that one. Okay, so F2 is the only one here that models the function in part A. Part B, now I'm going to look at a new function. As I'm looking at this new function here uh, in part B, what I see is I see opposite end behaviors, so this needs to be an odd degree. I also see it has three x-intercepts at the same time. I've got one here, I've got one here, I've got one here. I also see that as x approaches infinity, f of x approaches infinity. So I could tell that my right-hand end behavior is going up, which means a positive A value. Okay? And as I'm looking at F1, okay, I can see at F1, when I multiply it out, I have an X times an X times an X. That's going to be an X cubed. Yes, it's not an intercept form. I can see I do have an A value, A, of one half, and I do see that I could have a, a negative root, I could have another negative root, and I could have a positive root here. And if you remember from Wednesday, what that's going to do is that's going to shift my x-axis down three units. So I would quickly, uh, not quickly, but I could look and say one, two, three, and if I looked at this, being my x-axis, I'm not going to go that low because I don't know what this whole thing is and I don't want to skew it off, but I could grab one and throw it just underneath and say, hey, there's three, and see I have one, two, three of my transformed x-axes. So F1, I'm going to get rid of this green line for the next part of it. F1 could be a nice specimen for here. So I'm going to give this one a circle, as I could see, and an x cubed could have three x-intercepts. I'm not going to expand that out and solve it to see if I have two positive, two negatives, because it's transformed. That one could be. Now, when I'm looking here at my F2, F2 I'm noticing also is a cubic function, but I see F2 has an A value of negative 2, which me, would mean the right hand end behavior would be going down. This one's going up, so I will eliminate F2 because this one should, that one should be going, looking kind of like this based on the end behavior, so I'll rule that one out. When I look down here at F3, 
F3 is a quick rule out because I have one, two, three, four x's. This is going to be an x to the fourth, which means n behaviors have to be same. These are opposite. It cannot be F3 either. Now we're just going to come down here to page 275 and we're going to look at and complete the tables here. The first one for cubics, remember cubic is a third power and as the cubics are, okay, we have as x approaches infinity, f of x goes to infinity. So all I need to do is picture I know I could have an end behavior on the right side going up as long as the left side is going down. It doesn't have to be that way. The left side could be going down on a cubic, which could be going down, which means the right side would be going up. They're opposites. Okay. Possible number, <coughs> excuse me, x-intercepts for a cubic. Well, because it's degree 3, I could have 2 or, I'm sorry, I could have 3 or 2 or 1. Possible number of x-intercepts, well, or y-intercepts, I apologize. Y-intercepts, functions can only have one if it's a function, because if it has more than one y-intercept, it will fa fail the vertical line test. Now, we haven't talked about these possible intervals of increasing and decreasing here much at all, but just to give you an idea of how they're going to run, when we went through all of our... Uh, uh, packets that showed all the different shapes. Here's the shapes that I could have for a cubic. It could look like this, or it could have looked like this. Those were two. Or it could have looked like this with a couple wiggly squigglies inside. Or it could have looked like this with a couple wiggly squigglies with your end behaviors going opposite. So a cubic could always, always be increasing. This one's always going up and to the right. It could always be decreasing because left to right, this one's always falling. It could increase from here up to this maximum. Then it would decrease down to the minimum. Then it would increase again forever as it goes up. And the last one here would be decreasing from left to right. We would read it. It would decrease from there to my minimum. Then it would increase from my minimum up to my maximum, it's going up there, and right at the peak there's a change. And finally, it would decrease forever and on. So this should quickly explain how a function increases or decreases. Now I'm just going to erase those little guys. For No, I won't. I'm going to leave them on there. I'm going to say that one's there, that one's there, that one's there. And those are describing those, so when we hit our next functions, we will be able to nail those. Number of possible relative extrema. Well, when I come up here and I look at my graphs, the first two have none. But this one could have one here. It could have one here for a possible of two. And this one would have none because there are no humps or bumps in there. Absolute extrema. Absolute extrema on odd functions, they never can have them because their end behaviors, their end behaviors are always opposite, meaning I'm always going up and I'm always going down on one side or the other. Therefore, there is never an absolute high or low point on it. Remember, these this is relatively a high spot within a particular neighborhood of the graph. So what I'm going to have, we're going to come through do, we're going to do it for a quartic. A quartic is a fourth powered function, remember. So it would be like an x to the fourth. And what are all the possible end behaviors of a quartic? Well, as x approaches infinity or goes to the right, what could happen? The function f of x could go up or to infinity, or as x approaches negative infinity, or the left-hand end behavior on that, because it's even, f of x would be going in the same direction or up. Well, or the other way is as x approaches infinity, my function could be kind of more concave down, or the right side being going down, which means the left-hand end behavior as x approaches negative infinity, f of x 
would also go the same way because of the even function. As long as my n behaviors are the same, then I'm good. Possible number of x-intercepts for a fourth-powered function. Well, fourth-powered functions could hit the x-axis four times, three times, two times, one time, or no times. You don't have to have any x-intercepts for even-powered functions because your end behaviors go the same way. Number of y-intercepts, that's one for any and all functions. No functions can have more than that. Possible, increase, or possible intervals of increase and decrease. Well, here's where we want to try to think of our packet. Think of our packet and see what were all the different quartics looked like. They could have looked like this, or they could have looked like this, or they could have looked like this with a couple wiggles and squiggles, or they could have looked like this with a couple wiggles and squiggles, but those are the only shapes that we could have had for those. So as I look at the first one here, this one from left to right would decrease all the way down to the minimum. It would stop decreasing, then it would increase forever on out. Increase, and it would decrease, decrease, and then increase. So now my other one, or it could start from left, it could increase to the maximum, and then after the maximum, it falls, so then it would decrease on that interval. The next one we would be looking at, I could be looking at from left to right my W. Well, if I go left to right, if I'm starting in the top, my graph is actually falling down to the minimum, so it would be decreasing. After it's done decreasing, it nests out here in the bottom, then it will increase, okay, so it's going to increase up to that maximum. Once it hits the maximum, it's going to stop increasing, and then it's going to decrease back down to the next relative minimum. And after it stops decreasing, it's going to continue and it's going to increase up forever and never stop. Or the last one, the, the last black one, the black one could be increasing up to the maximum, then it's going to decrease down to the next relative minimum, then it's going to increase up to the next maximum, then it's going to make that final turn and decrease forever and never turn back. Number of possible rel <coughs> excuse me, relative extrema. Well, here if I'm looking at the first two, I could have one or if I look at my second graphs of cortex, I could have one, two, three, or I could have three. Okay, so remember your number of turns. Every turn could generate a bump or a hump. Number of possible absolute extrema? Well, there could only absolutely be one lowest point or highest point. This, this one the one I just boxed could never have an absolute maximum because these end behaviors are going the same, but it could have one absolute minimum where this last one here, this one would not have an absolute minimum because it's always going down, but I could pick one of these as an absolute maximum. Well, again, it could be back to one, or if you look at the parabola shape right in the beginning, you quickly see one absolute max or min. Extrema is, again, just talking about maximums and minimums. Absolutely the top dogs. Relatively the top. They don't have to be the highest. They are just in a general area. Now the very last one we're going to come to is we're going to come to our quintics. Quintics are fifth degree functions, or x to the fifth. And x to the fifth, this is going to be an odd degree function. So as x goes to the right, my function could go up, which means as I went to the left, my function would be going down. Or the other thing I could say is as x goes to the right, my function, my f of x, could be going down on the right-hand side, and if it's going down on the right-hand side, as I go to the left, 
the function would have to be going in the opposite direction on the right. Remember this here is just showing right sides going up, left sides going down. Odd degrees are opposite. This one's showing left side or right side going down, left side going up. Those are the only possible end behaviors of an odd powered function. Number of x-intercepts. Well, it's a fifth degree function, so I could hit it five times, or four times, or three times, or two times, or one time. But I have to hit it minimally one time because my end behaviors are opposite. Possible number of y-intercepts. Mr. Broken Book here, uh, they can only ever have one. Possible increase and decrease. Well, here I'm going to look. I'm going to draw a few more. Look, I'm going to cut my one off here and say that's the answer for that. Now my quintics, remember, could look like this, or they could look like this. Or they might have may have looked like this, or they may have looked like this. Or I could have even more turns in there. Could have looked like a couple of wiggles and squiggles like that, or a couple of wiggles and squiggles down. So I'm going to look at my increasing and decreasing intervals right off of these, and I'm going to kind of pair them all up the same way. And what I'm going to do is say this one is always increasing right here, or I am always decreasing right here. Now when I take these these middle two right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, first that the first one, this one here, increases, then it hits that relative maximum, and then it makes a turn and it goes down and it decreases, it hits that relative minimum, and then it increases and never comes back. Or its partner over here would be decreasing from left to right to the minimum, then it's going to make a turn and it's going to increase to the next maximum, and then it's going to make that turn and it will decrease forever. Or we come down to the very last one over here, these guys, and these guys are going to look like, if I read the first one, I will first increase to that first relative maximum, then I'm going to take a turn down and I'm going to decrease to the first relative minimum, then I'm going to turn and go back up. I'm going to increase. Then I'm going to turn and I'm going to decrease to that second relative minimum. Then I'm going to make a turn and I will increase forever. Or the second one over there, what's going to happen is I'm decreasing, then I'm increasing, then I'm decreasing, then I'm increasing, and then I am decreasing forever and ever and ever. Number of possible relative extrema. Well, if I look at my first diagrams up here, always increasing or always decreasing, those have zero. Or if I look at the next set, I look at my next pair here in option number one, I could have two, one min and one max. Or if I go down to the last set of diagrams, I could have one, two, three, four. And notice again that four right, reflects the number of turns. Every turn you can have a hump or a bump number of possible absolutes, okay? Again, this is going to be an odd-powered function because it's a fifth. My end behaviors are opposite, opposite. Therefore, this could not have any because there is never an absolutely highest point of the graph with opposite end behaviors. I hope this makes sense to you. Please ask me questions when I get back on Monday. If you are confused on anything, I will post these out on its learning so you can you know look at my and listen to my riveting voice again if you want. However, have a great weekend and thank you for your time and I will see you on Monday.